Hey guys, I'm Dan. Hi. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, stroke today and uh, have a slightly controversial uh, topic about TPA. Um, some of y'all that have been here for a little bit know that there's a controversy about TPA. Some of y'all that are fairly new may not know. So we're going to talk about that today. So I got no conflicts of interest um, at all about this. Don't take money from anybody. What? No, I, I cannot do his voice at all. <laughs> I'm offended that you would ask. Because when I read your emails, I'm reading your emails. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. So we'll start with the case. You got a 67 year old, fall down, found out to have stroke like symptoms, and then they get to you an hour or so later. This is kind of best case scenario. I don't think I've ever seen someone with suspected stroke that actually got to me much sooner than an hour, because that's really, really quick. And that's actually rarely seen. So, show of hands. Who thinks that, that thrombolytics, being TPA, are standard of care for stroke that meet current guidelines? So we're saying less than three hours, there's no bleed, significant stroke. Raise your hand if you think that that is standard of care. Offering or giving? We'll say that you should give it. So now we'll say, should you offer it? Okay. So most of the room says you should at least offer it. I didn't see more than maybe one hand for you should give it. Would you give it to a family member? Okay, so let's say that you're there and your mom's there and she's the lady that, that fell down and found out to have stroke symptoms, okay? We'll say that all the stuff that we said before, so it's quick, you know, it's an hour and a half later after the, the stroke, she's got these symptoms, they're significant enough to where people would consider giving lytics. Would you counsel your mother if she like looked to you because you're there in the ER with her, would you counsel your mom to take TPA? Okay, got, got a few more hands for that. And would you want it yourself? Let's say that was you. Let's say that you're the 67-year-old woman, which is a pretty big change for Merwin to become a 67-year-old woman. <laughs> but, you know, oh, he's not even here. That's terrible. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't closely look at his uh, interview packet. Maybe all this time Merwin's been a 67-year-old woman. I didn't know. Uh, but would you want it yourself if you were that patient and you met all these criteria? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, part of the frustration is that the number of times that you raise your hand for, should we offer it to our patients, should we offer it to a family member, and should we offer it for ourselves, should be roughly the same. Okay. Reason being, if a treatment works, we should go for it. And if it doesn't work, we should abandon it. Okay. And I'm going to talk about what I think from my current reading of the literature and how for all of these, I would actually lean towards the no. So... I'm going to say that the TPA is not a proven therapy, that we just don't know enough about it, and the literature, if you really deep dive on it, is actually not very supportive. So I'm going to cover five myths of thrombolytics. So one is that TPA is special, that all the information about older ones like desmotoplase or streptokinase don't apply to, to TPA or altoplase. Okay? The other myth is that it causes a Lazarus effect, because if you ever bring this up with neurologists, they'll say, yeah, I pushed it this one time, and then like 20 minutes later, they were able to play the piano, and it was beautiful. And they couldn't play the piano before, and it was entirely because of TPA that they learned. It's just this weird, weird thing, okay? Number three is that it was consistently beneficial, okay? So part of the reason that so many people are supportive of thrombolytics and stroke is because the only um, studies that we talk about were the positive ones, somehow forgetting all the ones that were negative. Uh, fourth is that it should be standard of care or considered that it's standard of care. And the fifth is that this is the only thing. So often people will say, well, if you don't believe in TPA, it's the only game in town. There's nothing else that can actually help these folks. So, so stop your yapping because we're just throwing a Hail Mary. So we have to say what's a stroke. We know what strokes are, okay? There's the ischemic, which is the ones that we're talking about for the rest of this when I say stroke, and hemorrhagic. Please don't give TPA to hemorrhagic strokes. I'm pretty sure there's no literature on that. So it's just as well supported as the other, but uh, don't give it to hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, strokes are terrible. This is the mandatory boring demographic uh, slide. If, if you didn't know that strokes were a problem, uh, you should really restart. Um, so why not only focus on TPA? So we brought this up earlier. It, isn't it special? And the reason is that, that, that people are so focused on it is that it costs a lot of money. Okay, And I feel like some of this debate about whether it would be a good drug or not would largely go away if this was a $5 drug. Okay. Saves lives in trauma. There wasn't this like upwell of support for it in many areas, partially because the drug's practically free. And so there wasn't anyone to make money off of it. 
So what are they? They're basically clot busters, okay? And we have to have this horrible physiology slide, but there's too much to cover. So uh, yeah, there's the thing and the pathway and sure. Uh, and if you know what plasminogen is, it turns out it turns into plasmin and TPA affects that. There you go. That's all you need to know. Uh, so myth one, is it different? And so I'm going to talk about the heart attack literature, okay? So back in the day when old people were on the earth, uh, there were a lot of questions about what we should do for heart attacks, okay? And it wasn't very clear at all what we should do. Should they go to the cath lab? Should they get lytics? And more importantly, which of those folks should go to the cath lab and who should get lytics, okay? And it's easy to look back if you have really only practiced medicine for a few years and think, of course we know that you should go to the cath lab and give lytics to STEMIs and forget that, wait a minute, they didn't know that for a long time. There were decades and decades of people having heart attacks. They knew they were having heart attacks, but they didn't know who should get aggressive treatment up front and who should basically just be watched to make sure they get better. Okay, and we didn't know for a while. So when they took a look at, at lytics for stroke or for heart attack, rather, it's overwhelmingly positive. It's not a huge benefit, but a very noticeable one. So you basically get a mortality benefit. And that's about a 2%. So you, you need to treat roughly 50 folks or so with lytics if you didn't have a cath lab in order to save a life with a, with a STEMI. Okay? And they had a huge number of patients, nearly 60,000 people, over nine trials. And the studies were consistently positive. They all honed in, give or take a little bit, at that 2% mortality benefit. None of them were negative. Okay? That's huge. And I want you to keep this in mind that it's not that medicine studies are hard. They are. But this was a very, very consistent finding in study after study. Interestingly, TPA actually had a worse performance for intracranial hemorrhage than streptokinase, which was a, an older lytic that's rarely used now. Okay, So it's very curious that that became the standard of care, um, quote unquote, for um, use in strokes because it's the one that's more likely to cause brain bleeds. So what about strokes? So now we only have 8,000 people, which is about one-seventh of what they had before. Okay, The majority of studies are negative, and we'll talk about that. There is a much higher risk of stroke, possibly because that tissue is already damaged in the brain because it's got ischemia. And so it's more likely to bleed than if you're just having a heart attack and your brain's fine. And there was no consistent time-based benefit. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later. Okay? So check the scorecard. All right? Everything looks better for the use of lytics and STEMI. And everything looks much worse for stroke. Okay? So, but this is what I'm talking about here, that we didn't know who should get it. Okay, if you pushed lytics on every instemi that walked through the door, you're going to be killing people because it doesn't help them. Okay, turns out it took us a long time and tens of thousands of patients to figure out, oh, these folks with ST depression shouldn't go emergently to the cath lab in the next hour. These folks with ST elevation really should. And the same thing for lytics, that if you present and you're having an ST elevating MI, then you should get lytics. And if you're not, you probably shouldn't with a few exotic, you know, wellins and whatnot. We can talk about that later. But those folks really shouldn't be getting um, lytics unless you have that. And we have no idea with, with strokes who should and shouldn't. So we're going to go really quickly through 12 trials. This is just a, a slapdash run through every major randomized controlled trial of um, lytics for stroke. Okay? At the top, you'll see different colors of headings. Okay? If it's blue, it means that there was no benefit. They ran their study, and they didn't really show that it was better or worse. Okay? If it's green, it means it was positive, okay? or at least reported as positive. And if it was red, it means it was actually stopped early due to harm. Okay? See if you can find a pattern. So this was the first one, masked in Italy. No benefit, less than six hours with streptokinase. Please note, tons of people are talking about using lytics for less than six hours, and uh, it didn't really work. Then ECAS, everyone likes to talk about ECAS 3, forgetting that they probably had an ECAS 1 and 2. Hmm, interesting. They, uh, they used TPA for this one for less than six hours. No difference in disability or death. NINS 1, again, people like to talk about NINS 2. Well, NINS 1 was robustly negative. And so this was um, deficits at 24 hours. This is our study that looks at the Lazarus effect, okay? If anyone ever says, yeah, yeah, I pushed the lytics and they got better right away, that person might be having a TIA. And the reason I say that is that there is no data at all in any randomized controlled trial for lytics and stroke that shows that people got better within one to two days of receiving them, period. It's not there, okay? So you may have personal experience where they got better, and that's fine. 
but I actually had a patient that I thought was actually having a stroke. The neurologist wanted to push Lytics, the resident did. The attending came down, found out that it was some really weird migraine thing, and she got better. <laughs> okay, so if it was really just me and the resident, she would have gotten Lytics, and she would have been that Lazarus effect. Didn't happen. She got better on her own because she was having a weird migraine thing. Okay, so this is your Lazarus effect study, and it was robustly negative. NINS2 is reported as positive, and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, this is the thing that actually got TPA on the map. Okay, so if you look back though, how many studies? So you got negative, negative, negative. Oh, we got one. Now it's standard of care. You better give lytics. And that's what happened. Once NINS2 occurred, people started talking about how can you not give this? It, it makes people better. Okay, we'll talk about all the problems of that study later. Now we got our first, actually, not just negative, but stopped early due to harm because it turns out people were dying. They had 47% mortality in this study. Admittedly, the placebo group had 38% mortality, but this was a number needed to kill of 11. <laughs> and that's not a comfortable sentence to say during your lecture. <laughs> they stopped halfway through because they're like, turns out we're murdering people, y'all. And so they're like, yeah, we better, we better cut that out. <laughs> and so that's what they did. And this is the very group that you would think would be the most benefit, okay? They're the moderate to severe strokes, all right? Smart neurologists have honed in not on the little bitty ones. You know, if you have just a touch of aphasia or, you know, maybe you have just a little bit of motor weakness, very few people are arguing for lytics for those folks. So this is the group that you would think. They had terrible looking scans that showed large clots in big vessels, but it actually just killed people. Then there was an ASK trial. Again, we uh, sort of kind of killed people, and so we stopped our trial early. Uh, then ECAS-2, oh, again, 800 patients, much, much larger than, uh, than NINS-2, and uh, still no difference. Atlantis-B, again, we, we stopped early. This one was more because it was hopelessly not going to work, but it was actually trending towards negative. Atlantis-A, again, which paradoxically came after Atlantis-B, but I, I digress. Uh, and it was stopped early due to harm, so we have yet another one that was stopped early due to harm. Dias-2, this one used Desmodoplace. And uh, they stopped studying it after it was uh, found to, to kill people again. So <laughs> they stopped it. ECAS-3, this is the, the, the study that showed not only can we give it for less than three hours, we're going to expand that up to four and a half hours. Okay? And that's where this came from. Okay? They only looked at people between three and four and a half hours. I want you to remember that time frame. Okay? From three to four and a half hours. Okay? That's what this study showed. And this is actually the single best positive trial of all of the positive trials, it was actually well done and very reasonable, okay? So we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about why I still don't believe what this study shows, but this is the single best piece of evidence, in my opinion, that, that thrombolytics may work for stroke. The range on ratio starts at 1.02. Indeed. That's as good as it gets, Jim. That's as good as it gets, is, is the 1.02, which means that even if this result was true, and I'll show you why I don't think that it was, uh, then it you had a 95% interval of only 2% benefit, which is pathetic, okay? And no mortality benefit. IST3, now I actually listed this one as inconclusive because I, I trusted the authors when they built their study and used their primary endpoint that they were using the whole time. They reported it as a robustly positive trial, and it's a bunch of hooey, all right? I will tell you that in a, in a second why, okay? But this was an unblinded study that had a comedic number of flaws to it. And, I, and I'll show you why I listed it as, as not positive. So let's check the scoreboard. All right, so number of trials per result, result. We got four studies that were actually stopped because of harm. We got six that were negative, And then we have two that were beneficial. And I'd be willing to bet that most people in this room, if they haven't heard me speak on this before, have not heard about the other 10 trials that were not positive and have talked at nausea about, about the, the two that were, okay? Which doesn't make any sense. Let's look at the number of patients. So you say, oh, well, maybe those, those trials that were, were negative, maybe they were tiny. Au contraire, my friend. Look at this. The number of negative trials were enormous. There's a ton of people versus we're actually basing quote-unquote standard of care on 1,100 people, okay? That's actually fewer than the number of patients that were in trials that were stopped early due to harm, Okay? This little red bar is what I call Dan's being a jerk bar, because this is what would have happened if they allowed the studies that were killing people to keep going, okay? There was no thought that, that oh, if we, if we stop now, the next 50 people we treat will magically get better. There wasn't. They knew the trial, at best, would go from harmful to negative, 
but they stop the trials early. So you don't get to, to call a timeout during the football game when you're losing terribly in the second quarter and then say, oh, okay, yeah, you were up by, by 10 points, but we were just really losing badly. Uh, we'll just say that we're only going to count that two quarter. You have to play the whole game and find out exactly how badly the Patriots were going to beat the Colts. And it's terrible to watch. Flake Gate's real. Uh, so <laughs> myth number two, the Lazarus effect. Let's talk about that. So, so everyone has this story, and this is really why I, I believe that the neurology folks are so into TPA is because they've seen it work, or at least they think they've seen it work, okay? Neurologists are not bad people, okay? They really aren't, okay? I don't want to demonize them at all. They have seen, I gave the medicine, and then an hour or two later, they felt better, okay? And that is really hard for us to ignore, okay? We have treatments that we treat the same way. How many times have you given that liter of fluid and the person just felt better and you're like, that was me. Yeah, yeah. I gave that liter of fluid. I fixed everything. In reality, they may have been getting better anyway, and you just happened to be around. So the, uh, the problem with this is that there's no data that shows this exists at all. The, in fact, the most robust data for it is actually, oh, three to six months from now, you're less likely to be disabled. Not two hours or four hours or even 24 hours where any theoretical Lazarus effect could have been picked up on. Every time they've looked, close to when you actually gave the drug, it didn't help, okay? The one trial that actually had an early outcome, okay, NINS1, at 24 hours, was robustly negative, not even close to positive, okay? So the Lazarus effect exists in the hearts and minds of people that have seen it work, but they don't have any data whatsoever to show it, okay? And if they actually get better that quickly, it's more likely that it's a stroke mimic or a TIA than it is for it to actually be a true ischemic stroke that should have gotten lytics in the first place. Uh, 10 points for whoever can identify the, uh, the Joseph DeCrew song here. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so there's the La- Lazarus bias, okay? So we like to claim responsibility because it's really uncomfortable for us to say, you know what, I gave that drug and it didn't work. Hindsight bias, I knew it all along. I knew that this drug would work all along. We just had all these negative studies. We're just going to ignore them. And then there's also the belief bias because it makes sense that if we unclog this, this vessel, then suddenly the person will get better. It's kind of like a plumbing analogy of, of neurology. Yeah, if we just open the pipe, things will get better. It just isn't true. So let's talk about the consistent benefit. So there's the big three, okay? These are the three that everyone likes to talk about. NS2, ECAS3, IST3. No accident that none of these were uh, NINS1, ECAS1 or 2, or IST1 or 2, which are actually looking at different issues. So Monty Python time, all right? The Black Knight emerges. So NINS2. So they basically lump people into ranking 0, 1, and 2. It's basically just a disability score. You don't need to worry about it, okay? It turns out that the number one factor that determines how bad you're going to do after a stroke is how bad your stroke is. This sounds trivial, but it gets forgotten, okay? If you have a massive stroke, okay, you come in and you're not even able to talk, you can't move one half of your body, it doesn't matter if I have a really, really great treatment or not, you're going to do poorly the vast majority of the time. If you come in and you are having a really tiny stroke, you know, maybe you have a little bitty bit of facial droop, maybe just a little bit of limb weakness, but everything else is fine, you're going to do fantastic because you're already doing well, okay? Even if I gave you nothing, if I rubbed some capsaicin cream on your forehead and said that was my treatment, you would do great because you're not having a large stroke. So the most important thing out of all this is how bad was it to begin with, okay? And it turns out that in this study, not because the the people doing the study were were bad people, but just statistically, it turns out that a vast majority of terrible strokes were happening in the placebo group so that they were not starting off as well, okay? So, and and I don't want to get paranoid, but the reason that they changed this, okay, because they actually changed it from their initial plan of how they were going to report the data was because this was funded by Genentech, the maker of TPA, okay? So they would not refuse their, uh, they would not release their data, even though there was a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit that went on for many, many years. Jerry Hoffman, the guy that's behind the Nexus criteria that we use to clear C-spines, fought for years in court to make them release the data because they refused to. And it's because they knew that once people actually looked at the actual patient data, their study, which is the entire basis for why they were giving TPA for many, many years, because it was the only one that was positive before um, ECAS-3, that the only reason that they had that was because they would not release the data. So what happens when you actually release the data and then let someone else crunch the numbers? Well, it turns out it's kind of sad 
because this is what their study originally said. Originally, their study was not, do you fall into zero, one, or two Rankin? It was, what is your change in Rankin after six months? Okay, now that seems like a, a small difference, but what happens is if you have a, a worse stroke, your change in Rankin scale matters a lot because you could go from a Rankin 4 to a Rankin 2, okay? But if you're just saying like, oh, well, when we stop, who's got Rankin 0, 1, or 2? Like, who's doing pretty well? Well, that was robustly positive. They had a very positive result with that because they changed their primary outcome, not because their study actually worked. So what they did here was actually looked over the 90 days of the study, they actually looked at what the, uh, the curve was for whether you would get better or worse, okay? And statistically speaking, these are exactly the same. Whether you got lytics or not, they are exactly the same. If lytics worked, you would see a large separation of those blue and green lines showing the, the treatment benefit of, of lytics, okay? And it didn't happen, okay? And the reason it didn't happen was this corrects for the fact that the people that were getting placebo were sicker to begin with. So there's no way that they're going to get better as quickly as the people that weren't that sick. Okay, and it's entirely because they changed the primary outcome. So this is the best case scenario per AEM using this study, and it's wrong because it doesn't correct for that. Okay, so what they did here was something called data dredging, where you do a study, you don't like the results, and you just move the goalposts. You just say, you know what, that Georgia-Georgia Tech game did not go well last year for me. Uh, I, I don't want to look at the number of points. I want to look at the total number of rushing yards or something like that and saying, oh, look, we, uh, we had more rushing yards, uh, which actually I don't think was true that, that game. <laughs> Sorry. More passing yards. We got you on that one. Sorry, Matt. Uh, but you can't do that. You, you say, hey, look, when we started this game, we said who can score the most points, not who had the most passing yards. Okay? So you're data dredging, okay? which at best is something to do a hypothesis generation from. So you could take this study and say, look, I, I don't actually want to look at the change from, from your ranking scale. I want to look at who gets to zero, one, or two. We're going to do a new trial and randomize folks. And that's totally scientifically legit. And you can do that. They didn't do that. They just basically made up the data. So the other problem is that the people actually running the numbers was Genentech, which is funny because the drug company actually basically wrote the paper for them. There were some errors in calculations that showed hemorrhage, or sorry, the, uh, the infarct size that was larger than the head of the patient. They said that the, uh, the volume of brain that was ischemic was actually larger than a human's head, um, right? I, you know, I could name certain people that may have had a head large enough to where they could have had a, a stroke that size, but I'm not going to because that would be a low blow, and he's not here. Uh, <laughs> and they fought this Freedom of Information Act. Okay, which if you had a good study and you know it worked, you'd be like, look, here's the data. Enjoy. Ah, it's, it's but a scratch. <laughs> so ECAS 3, this is my favorite of the positive trials. Okay, when people do good literature, you, you should give them props. Okay, and they did a pretty good job. Now, the problem is, is that they barely eked it out. Okay, their confidence interval went to 1.02, as, as Jim pointed out. Okay, which means that the 95% confidence interval is barely positive. Okay but it looks like it was positive, okay? Now, one thing that was curious about this is they actually excluded severe strokes, which are the very folks that were most focused on, okay? So it's kind of quirky that they did this, okay? So, yeah, this is not bad, not bad. But wait, <laughs> they actually put in their protocol before they did the study that if we see any difference between the two groups, because they saw what happened in NINS2, and they wanted to correct for it, that if there is a statistically significant difference between those two groups when they start, we're going to do a statistical correction, okay? Which is totally scientifically valid. You could say if we randomly get more people with diabetes, and it turns out that diabetes is really relevant for how these folks do, we're going to correct for it so that we don't have to do the bend over backwards thing that, that they had to do for NINS2, okay? And so they said, yeah, if it, if it gets down below 0.004, then, then it was randomly biased in one group, and so we're going to correct for it. And it turns out that they just screwed up the math. And whether it was intentional or unintentional, I don't know, but they listed it as 0.03 when if you calculate it, it's 0 0.003, okay? Which means that if you actually corrected for it, because this was a significant factor about whether you had a prior stroke, because it turns out if you're presenting with more than one stroke, you're more likely to have future strokes, and you're more likely to already be disabled because of your, of your prior strokes. So if you correct it, now the new odds ratio is actually 0 0.89 to 1.59, making this, too, a negative study. So I don't think that there was any, any 
problem with what they were doing. They had good intentions, but they screwed up their numbers. And when someone double-checked their work, found out that if they did the study the way they were supposed to, it's actually a negative study. And this is the absolute best piece of evidence that they have to support it. Okay? Did they put out a report? No. No, this was a little bit of the... <laughs> I'm sure it was more scientific than that, but no, they, they never stated why it was that they didn't correct the way they were supposed to. Much, much to the chagrin of quite a few um, naysayers. Ah, it's just a flesh wound. So IST3, this was the largest of these studies, and I use study in a loose way because there are comedic errors in the way that they did this thing um, that took what could have been a huge opportunity to really, really answer this question and instead made it a joke, okay? So IST3 has the worst moving of the goalposts ever. They, they running out of time to recruit patients, and so they basically said, no, 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 we're, we're completely abandoning not only what we said our primary outcome was going to be, we're pulling out something that wasn't even a secondary outcome. We're just totally making something up. And they, they conned an Irish statistician to be like, yeah, that, that sounds good. I bless it. And then they published a paper as positive. So we'll, we'll show you how they did that in a second. So you don't get to change your primary outcome. Like Highlander, there can only be one, okay? It's because it's a primary. And this sounds basic, but I get sick and tired of reading papers where it's like, well, of the three primary outcomes, it, no, you get one. It's primary. Everything else is secondary. Seems basic, but they, they just screw it up. So this is how you prevent data dredging, okay? Secondary outcomes are great, and you can talk about it and say, hey, someone should do a study. We turns out that diabetics are different, and they should get different treatment. That's great. All you're doing is generating a hypothesis, not proving anything, okay? So what they used was something called the Oxford Handicap Score. Very similar to the Rankin scores. You don't really need to know the details. The, the lower your number, the better off you are, okay? So, you know, this morning I haven't had a lot of coffee yet, so I'm around a one right now. But, you know, if I get my coffee, I get down to a zero, okay? Um, and then five is terrible, terrible sadness. So this is IST at six months. And this is what was supposedly like this huge change. And if you look at it, it's really pretty close, okay? So the problem is, is that when they completely made up this ordinal analysis, they decided where to draw the line. And it turns out that there are several ways that you could divide this up. You could say, all right, our outcome is zero versus one through six, or zero and one through two through six, or zero, one, and two versus three through six, and so forth. You could slice that pie more than one way. Turns out the only way, even in this disastrously poorly done study, that you get a statistically positive outcome is the way that they did it at zero, one, and two, because I crunched the numbers, and every other way fails. Every other way. If you slice it there, it doesn't work. There, it doesn't work. Here, does work, got reported, doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. I don't think that that was a coincidence, okay? I just really don't. So that's what they did. And they just made up this and, and recruited a, a statistician to bless it. The other part, and this is the really fun part for me, is the study started off as a blinded randomized controlled trial and looked like it was going to be awesome because it was literally going to get thousands of patients in a randomized controlled trial to see whether placebo versus TPA worked. And it was going to be, this was going to be the, the show ender, okay? Because it was going to have 10 times as many patients is what NINS2 did. This was going to shut up the critics and make guys like me just stop talking about it, okay? So they did a blinded portion for about 300 patients, and there was actually a trend towards statistical significance of harm from TPA, and they stopped. And the reason they stopped, they say, is Genentech had gotten approval for people to be given it to at least four and a half hours and consider it up to six. They had been given approval in some jurisdictions for that. And so they pulled the drug. Genentech stopped giving them the $2,000 a dose drug. And so the, the study authors could no longer afford to do their study. And they had thousands of remaining patients to recruit, and thousands times thousands turns out to be millions, and they couldn't afford to do it. Okay? So we went from the blinded section, which was robustly negative, almost statistical significance that it was harmful in that first 300 folks, which is about the same number of people as what they had in the entire NINS trial. Then you look at the unblinded portion, and it actually somehow becomes positive and things get better. Why is that? Well, turns out placebo is the thing, y'all. And the amazing part of this is that you couldn't even get into this study unless both you as the provider and the patient believed the patient would get better with TPA. 
unbelievably, they made it an inclusion criteria into their study that if you weren't susceptible to placebo, you're out, which is phenomenally amazing. You can't do that in an unblinded trial, okay? You just can't. It's crazy. And then they made no effort to blind it on the vast majority. And you'd say, well, what does that matter? I mean, surely people just get better, right? And like no one's going to fudge whether they're a, a Oxford 2 versus a 3. Well, it turns out the way that their primary outcome was structured was you would literally ask the patient, do you feel like you're better? That's literally their primary outcome. They would call them or send them letters and ask them to say how well they're doing. So if you're in an unblinded study, and to get into that study, you had to say, I believe that TPA works, which is essentially what they had there. And then they ask you later as their primary, their new primary endpoint is, do you feel like you got better? Well, I sure hope so. Otherwise, you didn't belong in the study. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And that's how they, they ran it, okay? So they changed the hypothesis, okay? And they never reported the original. They would not report the original. It's still unavailable. We have no idea because you can't get access to the full data set on this. So a guy like me, even if I had a really weird weekend and a lot of beer to like crank through these numbers and generate the study as it should have been done, can't do it because they don't have the data, okay? And then on top of that, it's got some really quirky things. It used to be that the standard response to why was that study negative, they say, you know what? It's them old people. That's what's getting us. And I agree with you. You shouldn't trust old people, okay? But the, the thing is, they had the most benefit of any group. And I won't trust myself. <laughs> so, so that was the standard response. If you go back through the years before this trial was done, every time they're like, oh, why, why didn't ECAS-1 work out? They're like, it's them old people. They, they did terribly with their drug. And I was like, you're right. And so did the people that were young. Um, but the problem here is that they did phenomenal in IST-3. It turns out that group had as good, if not slightly better benefit than the young folks. So their prior arguments of why do we have like eight negative studies, why was that? It completely falls apart because they just shot themselves in the foot. Additionally, they had a really bizarre set of time frames when this works. So if you got lytics between zero and three through their incredibly flawed math, you had a good outcome. If you got your lytics between four and a half hours and six hours, you had a good outcome. But if you got it between three and four and a half, you actually trended towards harm to where it was nearly statistically significant that you were harmed by lytics between three and four and a half hours. I just said that despite its flaws, um, the ECAS study actually showed that was the group that they were looking at. So the best study that they have is between three and four and a half hours. This one nearly statistically proved, even with all its flawed methodologies, that that was the group of people that were harmed. It doesn't make any sense. If this drug works, it should have a direct gradient of time to benefit. They have a robust set of literature for this for heart attacks, okay? If you get lytics at 30 minutes compared to 60, compared to 90, compared to 120, you do better the earlier you get. So you really shouldn't wait if you're ever in a community place and you're debating whether to push lytics for a STEMI. You give it as soon as possible. And we don't see it. The data is not there that shows that, yeah, you know, three hours is actually better than four hours, is better than five hours. There's not that trend, which means that we don't understand what we're doing. All right, so we'll just, we'll just call it a draw. So then it raises the, the question of e efficacy versus effectiveness, which are way too similar words for two very different things. So efficacy is, it, does it work when it works perfectly? Okay, so if I was doing an ultrasound study looking for DVTs and I said, Rich Gordon and Matt Lyon are going to be the folks doing it, that's an efficacy thing. Like, could a superhuman ultrasonographer produce good results from DVT ultrasounds? Which, the answer is yes. Then you have to look at effectiveness, okay? So do they teach a very flawed person like myself who's not that great at ultrasound how to do a DVT scan? Am I actually any good at it, or am I terrible compared to the experts, okay? This matters a lot because strokes are tricky. If you poll a bunch of folks, it's really, really hard to, to definitively say, like, that guy's having a stroke versus is it something else? How often do you call down the neurology folks who, who love to talk about strokes, and you and them disagree about whether someone's having a stroke, or is it a seizure, or the atypical migraine that apparently is running rampant through Augusta where like 90% of my neurology patients are having atypical migraines. I, I don't know. Like it, you can't really tell. So they had the Cleveland stroke trial. It's not that Cleveland though. Uh, they actually looked at all the people that got um, TPA in Cleveland in one year and it is terrifying. Okay. Cause this was just a community hospital. There's nothing special. These aren't the world experts doing a trial. And it turns out that the mortality in hospitals that used TPA was 16% versus 5% in those that didn't. 
And what that tells me is that if you're looking at studies where things are perfect, okay, and you've got world experts, and you've got people that, that read every article and stroke ever, they may be able to make TPA kind of sort of work, at least well enough to where they only had to stop four trials because they were killing people as opposed to eight, okay? But when you actually try it in the community setting where it's just you at 2 a.m. and you get that head CT and it's negative and you're like, I think they're having a stroke, should I push the lytics? Because that's the real world. That's what happens, okay? Any of you guys that have moon lit know that that's the, the reality of it. Like, would I push lytics here if I didn't have a neurologist on the phone? If it wasn't for really good guys like Hartman Gross using reach carts to make sure that we're not pushing lytics on stuff that we really shouldn't, like, that's, that's unusual. Very few places have that. And I'm really thankful those guys are there so that we're not doing more harm. Then there's all the stroke mimics. We're running a little bit behind on time, so I'll go through that. Uh, spoiled at an academic center because I have neurologists that can come down. So we're kind of the best case scenario uh, of who could use lytics, and I still don't think it works. So they did a Cochrane review, okay? And this actually shot a lot of the myths down of TPA. They actually show no difference between agents, which is the whole reason why they ignore some of the negative trials that use other agents other than TPA and, and just focus on the positive TPA ones. But they didn't have any difference based on those, okay? And they also very clearly stated the, the known increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage, okay? But it ignored the other thrombolytics within that same article, which doesn't make any sense. And they didn't appropriately um, take into account the fact that, that the uh, trials that were stopped early weren't included as extra numbers. So we'll continue on for time. So ASEP puts out guidelines about lytics, okay? And there's level A, B, and C evidence. So A, where everyone is, is believing that something should be done. This is like aspirin for STEMI, okay? You really should be doing this. There's not a lot of debate. If you talk to someone, they're like, I don't know, that whole aspirin for STEMI thing seems overrated. You need to stop listening to them, okay? They just don't know what they're talking about. Level B, where it's like, I, I think this works, but I can't really prove it. It makes a lot of sense, um, but there's reasonable people could disagree, okay? And then level C, this is largely like the we just haven't studied it realm, okay? So you get like a good old boy sitting around a table, gobsat kind of recommendations, like me and my buddies think that you should do this. We don't have any data for it. And there are valid things where that's the case. A lot of toxicology literature is that way. Because you know what? You're not going to get that 10,000-person randomized cyanide trial anytime soon. No one's getting placebo, all right? You just won't. So it will probably always be that it's just, yeah, I think you should give the drug, you know, and that's fine, okay? So ASAP revised their policy in 2012 after all these studies, all right? So they had a level A in 2012 saying that you should offer to treat ischemic stroke with lytics within three hours of onset of symptoms, all right? Just offer it, okay? It actually very wisely didn't say whether you should give it or not, but there, there should be a discussion of it, okay? And it was basically, they, they ripped the, e, uh, the, sorry, the NINS2 data straight from the paper and put it in the guidelines, okay? It's like, if you would have qualified for an NINS2, you get in. And then level B was to consider, yeah, you don't even have to offer it now, you just have to consider it uh, within three to four and a half hours and then ripped the ECAS3 um, guidelines straight in there. So just whatever it was that you, to get into ECAS-3, they just plugged it in with no level C, okay? And then they, they very wisely stated that, look, we don't know what's going to happen if you try this in community setting, okay? And that was actually in the guidelines. So it turns out that the, uh, the deck was stacked there because the number of people with conflicts of interest that were actually writing this is very high. So four of the eight authors had pharmaceutical company conflicts. Three of them were actually getting money directly from Birmingham Ingelheim, the people that make TPA, okay? And authors who actually did research for NINS helped write the outline of the guideline. It was just horrifically stacked, as opposed to getting independent folks to do it. So they, they tried to establish a standard of care. So then ASEP had a lot of folks like me and other people that are really annoying complain about this, saying, look, this is not what, what we asked. We, we need you guys to, to be more clear about, about what's going on. And they, they basically wanted to make a revision, okay? So they had an open forum for revision. And I don't know if ASEP's going to do this very often because they were flooded with people um, that were saying, look, I don't think this works, okay? A lot of the thought leaders in academic emergency medicine are doubters of TPA, a lot of them, okay? And so they had an open forum for revision and people wrote in. I wrote in. I hope some other people in this room wrote in um, about saying what, what we believed. So the only level A was that there was a known risk of intracranial hemorrhage. In almost every study, except for ECAS-3, weirdly enough, there was about a 7% risk of brain bleeds with TPA. 
and about half the people that got a brain bleed die, okay? So you got to pretty much, you push the plunger, it's like a known 3% kill rate, okay? Now, some of the, that, that group of people will still get better, and so they might do roughly the same later, okay? But that's a known proven thing that's been shown through thousands of patients, and that was the only level A. The, later, this gets changed, okay? But there were no other level A recommendations. Everything else was level B or lower. So they changed it after the open revision, and people got really mad, okay? This is too small to read. I'm going to only zoom in on this box right up here to what happened in the change of the level A recommendations. This happened a couple months ago, okay? So in the, the 2015 draft, which is what happened after people wrote in like me, saying, I'm angry and have enough time to type about clinical policies. And uh, science, science. Uh, and so <laughs> what happened is the only level A was that it, it causes bleeds, okay? That was it, okay? Then in 2015, they dropped the level A that it causes bleeds and then changed the IVTPA should be offered and may given from the may be offered that they have in 2012. So they just put a, a word, and it sounds a little different, between you might offer it to you should offer it, and you may give it. And then the increased risk should be considered, and that's it. They dropped it from a level A. Now, was there anything that happened in the last few months that would have changed how often people get brain bleeds with TPA? No. There, there has been no study that has come out since when they opened this up to now that has any impact on this whatsoever. None. They had no new data, and they downgraded the one thing that we're certain of, that everyone that knows what they're talking about would say, that there's a 5 to 7% increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage when you give TPA. It's the only thing everyone in the room could agree with. And they downgraded that bit of thing from a level A to a level B with no reason. No reason whatsoever. And then they changed the language from what everyone was saying, of saying, you may consider offering it, to you should offer it. With completely ignoring, are you at a hospital that has any business giving this drug? Should docs in Barnwell feel like they should be doing this? Does that make any sense? And I would say the Cleveland Stroke Trial and many others like it would say no. Like if you don't have a dedicated stroke neurology team, you got no business giving this. Okay, if you can't get a Hart McGross or someone like him on the phone through a reach cart, you should not be just pushing this willy-nilly. And the American Heart Association is pure evil. Uh, they got, <laughs> they're, amazingly, their conference headquarters, their, the headquarters of the AHA, was literally built by Genentech. And so I think that goes a long way towards explaining why on earth the American Heart Association is one of the, the biggest pushers of TPA for stroke, forgetting the fact that the heart and the brain are two very different organs. It's just really weird. They actually, they actually said, they had a press release saying, TPA saves lives. And then someone said, Where, where's the study for that? Because... Uh, Actually, it increases mortality, but may improve, improve disability, best case scenario. They're like, well, we'll retract that because sorry. <laughs> it's, really, it's really funny. So Genentech's pure evil. They're just, they're just terrible. Uh, so you say, like, okay, I hear you, Dan. Like, you don't like TPA. What am I going to do? I got this guy. Like, what are you going to do? Are you just going to give him nothing? Are you going to rub some capsaicin on his forehead? Which might work. There's you know, good. Y'all remember the head-off commercials? Like, what was it, head-on? They just said, like, head-on, like, 95 times during it. It might work. I don't know. So, so aspirin is legit, okay? Whenever someone's like, hey, should we give aspirin or not? The answer is yes. Uh, I think, like, GI bleeders should probably get aspirin. I mean, like, everybody should get it. <laughs> everybody should get aspirin. All right. So they, they did some studies, the Cochrane Reviews. There were nine studies. Almost all of them were, were two studies. Like, 40,000 of those 41,000 and change people were from two studies. So you got IST... And then you got cast. And I'm running out of time. They were positive. Okay? So what happens if you just give an aspirin? Okay? You don't give anything else. You're just like, you're having a stroke. Here's your aspirin. And we'll continue it for a few more weeks. The number needed to treat to save a life is 79. TPA can't say that at all. They have no data showing that they have a mortality benefit. Aspirin does. The number needed to treat is in the 80s for complete recovery. Not, oh, you're a little better. You're all the way better. 89. Okay? The number needed to treat just over 100 for all causes of death, not just stroke-related death, but just did you have a heart attack or did you die of a PE or, or whatever. All got better for aspirin. Why is this so relevant? Because it looks so much better than TPA, and it costs nothing. You can buy a lifetime supply of aspirin at Costco for like $3. I mean, every <laughs> tab of aspirin you could ever imagine, okay? You can go to the name brand stuff if you want. Like, that's fine. Like, that is fine if you want it. 
get that good coating and all that. And we never talk about aspirin, ever. And the reason is, is that there's not a drug company that's making real money off aspirin. They just aren't, okay? So the, every way, it's safer. It, it's partially reversible because if you're wrong and they're actually having a hemorrhagic stroke, you could, you could give them platelets. It's beautiful in every way, and we just don't do it. So this table, the NNT, looking at STEMIs, aspirin's about as good as lytics, okay? For stroke, 77 for mortality versus TPA, no. The infinite um, number needed to treat before you save life. So here's where I get really mad, is you'd say, well, surely those studies that were comparing TPA to placebo gave aspirin, right? Surely they would have done that, right? It's the only thing that I, I actually see great data for that has consistently shown that it works. No, they didn't. And the reason was is because they're lazy. Um, and here's why. You can't give aspirin at the same time that you give TPA. You're actually supposed to hold off on it. It's commonly forgotten that if you have a stroke patient that you think is a stroke and it's not hemorrhagic and you don't give TPA, which is most of our stroke folks, you should give them an aspirin while they're in the emergency department. Okay? We forget that all the time. It's very easy to forget. But, but look at this. They actually, the placebo folks didn't get just current best care. They got no care. It's either you got TPA and no aspirin or you got nothing and no aspirin. So that thing that I just showed you where about one out of 80 folks get completely better because of aspirin, they totally threw that group out because they didn't get an aspirin. And all they would have had to do is, here's your TPA and a placebo dummy pill that's white, and here's your normal saline push, and here's your actual aspirin. That's all they would have had to do. Would have cost very, very little in the study, would not have added any real complexity, and they didn't do it. So even with these garbage studies that made huge statistical errors or were unblinded and all of this, they weren't even using the current best level of care, which was aspirin. I don't know how an IRB let this get through because people were being harmed by not getting an aspirin right away when they were being randomized into placebo groups in these studies, and no one talks about it. But wouldn't it have made the trial aspirin versus PA? It, it would, but usually that's the appropriate trial. Yeah, because aspirin we knew worked. But yes, you're correct that technically they were saying nothing versus TPA. When if you had a stroke before TPA, everyone got an aspirin. Everybody got an aspirin. So it's really inappropriate to, to do nothing. It, it'd be like doing a pneumonia study and saying, well, we're going to try this new killicillin versus nothing. You don't get anything for your pneumonia. We'll see how you do. You can't do it. I, that, that's to be a shock. So, and nobody talks about this. And that's what kills me is that, like, how on earth did this happen? that we weren't even bringing up the fact that these folks didn't get aspirin, okay? So it's terrible that even with that huge advantage of you weren't even getting the standard of care of aspirin, which I actually do think is a true standard of care looking at the evidence that you should get aspirin after a stroke, then even with that, the studies are still questionable to where I don't think that they actually work. Another thing, and, and this is another thing that's just really not sexy at all, it turns out that if you get really, really good nursing care, people do better. And it's shocking how robust this data is where the number needed to treat for mortality of 29 is crazy. And it makes sense. Anybody that spent any real time on like an internal medicine service where the folks that just kind of stay there and people aren't getting up and mobilized and getting aggressive rehab versus if you've ever been at a place that did that, where they're like, oh man, they're walking every day, they're aggressively getting back to the quality of life stuff, those folks get better. Because it turns out if you just rot in the bed, like you don't get better. And it, it sounds terrible, but it's really hard. And this takes a lot of money, okay? This is not cheap. This is not knocking the, the inpatient units. It takes a lot of time and nursing money to get that guy up and get them walking and so forth, okay? But it works, and it's more, it's even better than aspirin, which I, I hate saying that line. Uh, we don't have enough time to talk about these things. There, there were some old studies that were negative, Mr. Clean, which is one study, and then a bunch of the things that got stopped early. We're moving on. So TPA? They're already looking at replacing it because the patent's running out soon, okay? So <laughs> this, this is true. So Tenecteplase will probably be the next TPA. And uh, sadly, with this huge study of 75 patients, they showed that it was better than TPA. Good job. And someone has said, oh, it's a Lazarus-like effect, and it's going to be the new standard of care. And yes, I'm totally receiving money. <laughs> There's also this amazing study. This is one of my favorite studies ever. They, they hooked up this sweet ambulance with a CT scanner and then, like, crashed around Europe in it. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. 
like, I don't know how they pulled this off. I'm kind of proud for building this, like, ridiculous thing. They call it the Steemo. I mean, it's just amazing. It's got a CT scanner, and, like, a neurologist would ride around in it, and they, like, throw you in there, and they'd scan you, and then they'd push lytics. And uh, it's amazing. It was $1.4 million to build it, and it took, like, hundreds of thousands of man hours to do this. And the only thing that they could prove is, yes, it turns out if you have a CT scanner on wheels, you give lytics faster. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> they had zero data that people actually got better with this, which seems like a colossal bad idea to go lights and sirens after you just push thrombolytics. Because if you crash, that person is done. <laughs> they are done. Because <laughs> they just got pushed lytics. So, and then what's happening to our EMS system? People are driving all over the place. Because if you had a stroke and you're out in the middle of the woods, and like you, you, the nearest hospital is 20 minutes away, they'll be like, no, 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 don't drive there. Drive an hour to this big center where they have neurologists that can push lytics. Okay? So this is royally messing up our EMS system by making these, these uh, transports go longer and longer to get to them to these centers. So here's the, here's the real problem. This is the thing that makes me the angriest out of everything, okay, is that now we can't study it anymore, okay? So it's not like these folks that, that are supporters of TPA say, all right, I hear what you're saying, Dan. The math looks good. We should do more trials to figure out what that group is. We should find that STEMI. You know, what is that group of people? Because I actually believe that TPA works for somebody. I don't know who that is. Are these 65-year-old diabetics with a certain type of stroke? Are they a, a narrow range of people with disability scores? We don't know. But Lytics probably works. It may only work in such a small group that it's really, really hard to pull off, like within 45 minutes of you having a stroke or something like that. But brain tissue dies really, really quick, okay? And so it may be that it's almost impossible to use correctly, but there is that group. So that if you ever have someone in the waiting room that literally has a stroke in front of you, that you know that you should rush and go get Lytics. That, that, that group exists. We just don't know. But because of neurologists saying that this is the standard of care, they will not allow us to study it anymore. Okay? They took those two questionably positive studies out of 12 and said, now it's standard of care. You can't look at this anymore. You can no longer do trials. No one is doing trials of TPA versus not TPA. The only trials that are really happening right now are TPA versus interventional clot stuff, which is not the question I want to ask. I really want to emphasize that neurologists are, are not bad people. They have a potentially very frustrating field. Because when the brain gets hurt, it doesn't recover very well, okay? And so if you have a stroke, they, they had to suffer for decades of, oh, well, you got nothing better than aspirin. And everyone wants to get in there and do something. Trauma surgeons want to cut. Neurologists want to push lytics. That's part of the human experience, okay? I want to give antibiotics when a septic guys come in. Like, you just want to do something. It's really frustrating to say, oh, no, you shouldn't. So we should be taking this money that we're spending on lytics, giving it to nurses. We should be doing more studies to actually find that group, okay? And we need to stop torturing our EMS system, okay? So they're not driving around for hours because you have to bypass these smaller hospitals, okay? So some people ask, like, would I use it if it actually did kill people, okay? Like, you have this theoretical drug where I'm going to give it to you, and if you're either going to get totally better or you're going to die, okay? And if that ratio of death to completely better was good enough, I would 110% be in on this drug, Okay? I am not actually bothered at all by the fact that TPA probably increases mortality. If I had a significant stroke or a family member of mine had a significant stroke and they were disabled, I would absolutely throw that Hail Mary pass and say, look, I really, really want to get all the way better, okay? I don't want to get a little bit better and then just be bedridden, okay? I'm okay with that. So the mortality stuff actually doesn't bother me. So if I had a stroke, give me an aspirin right away. I, I might not even want to wait on the CT scan. If I'm having a hemorrhagic stroke, you can just give me platelets later. It's fine. Uh, I don't want any TPA. Uh, I want to be transferred to a place with good nursing care that can actually get me up and mobilized, okay? And I would say keep those catheters away from me. I just don't think that there's enough literature that says that this is a good idea. I know that there have been three papers recently that have showed that in certain centers they had good success rates with a very small subset of people, but I, I don't want those things in me at all right now. So now what do you do? So I think that we need better guidelines. I think ASEP needs to revise their clinical policy. There's a bunch of folks like myself that are raising quite a bit of hell over this. Um, correct. You absolutely are. 
And we need to have better decision making with neurology ourselves and the patient to actually discuss them the risks and benefits of these things. We got to improve our nursing care a lot. And we need to keep studying this to find out what that group is, okay? And I really want to emphasize, and this is a sad trend in my lectures, of saying, I'm going to tell you this stuff that doesn't work, and I'm going to go tell you to do it. And unfortunately, I'm stuck saying that you should probably continue to call neurology and give lytics when advised by the guidelines, okay? One angry academic that reads too much literature is not enough to change a clinical policy. We absolutely need to work with our neurology colleagues. And right now, they come down, they talk about folks. I have never stopped anyone from giving lytics ever. By sheer happenstance, I have never actually given it for stroke. Okay, I don't know how that happened, but it's never been uh, relevant. And that's really unlikely. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I do give aspirin to all my stroke folks if they're not getting lytics. I mean, it, it really is shocking how many people don't get that. But don't be a cowboy about this, okay? We still need to work with our neurology colleagues. We are a, a stroke-centered hospital. And if you go out there and cause inappropriate trouble for folks trying to give an agent, if it's going to work, it probably works better earlier. There's actually very little data for that. But don't be a jerk about this, okay? you got to work with them. And that's what I, I flew past, the Mr. Clean, and then a, a bunch of other fairly small trials with it. Mr. Clean was a pretty well-done trial. The main thing I would say about this is that effectiveness versus efficacy. So I know that they were able to get decent results in the Mr. Clean trial at these large centers that had the world's experts with neurointerventional catheters and intraarterial TPA and that stuff. I don't know that that's going to work in real hospitals with real people because of the Cleveland trial. When I understand the literature, So they did the same thing with, with stroke for regular TPA as well. Whenever they stopped early because of benefit, you better believe that they looked at the numbers and like, they look legit, publish it. You know, and that's what they did. They all published at the same time and, and stopped early. The, the studies did look pretty well done, but it's a statistical nightmare to figure out whether your results are actually significant if you call the game early. Because that would be like Georgia calling the game when they were beating Tech last year in the second quarter. And then something happened in the fourth quarter, and I don't want to talk about it right now. Uh, but that's kind of what happened. But I think the Mr. Clean trial was a pretty well-done study. It has its problems, but I think it's mostly in the applicability elsewhere. And it completely ignores the fact that study after study before it were all negative. So I think that it's calling the game early to say that, look, we can't even study this anymore. We've proven that it works. When they had several studies before Mr. Clean that were actually larger than Mr. Clean, they were all negative. I think, I think they're calling the game too early. But I think interventional like methods are actually probably the future, and some of those probably work for a very narrow subset, but they only accepted about 1% to 2% of all strokes to actually get those catheters. So there's certainly not an overall systems uh, solution to this problem. Yeah, what, you're, what you're describing here, you know, it basically it sounds really bad, that basically industry is driving um, physicians to do things that are in industry's best interest, but not necessarily the patient's best interest. Amen. When we do the flu <laughs> test or the flu lecture in a couple of months, I'll be talking about a drug named for rent called Paramavir. Exactly the same thing has happened with that. Yeah. I was part of the trial that showed it doesn't work. It's now being recommended by CDC because the company found a way around the data. It's, it's pretty. All right, so. I just don't know how to get around them being like, well, what are we just going to do the next study that will show? There was a neurologist that <laughs> Yep. We just haven't done the right study to show that it works. There's such a belief in a drug. We're just going to keep studying it. So the mark of a good scientist is the willingness to change their mind about something. I was one of the biggest therapeutic hypothermia folks. Uh, in the program. I, I may have cooled the first person in the MICU here as a resident because I, I'm sorry, Richard, I literally stole cold saline from downstairs, told the nurse, and then went upstairs and cooled the guy while I was a, a MICU rotator, okay? Probably shouldn't say that on a microphone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. But, but basically, I saw the moment and I struck and the attending was like, I don't know what Dan's doing, but okay. And we cooled him and I felt great about it. And then a study comes along that's bigger than the old studies and showed that actually we don't need to cool him that cold. We just need to cool him a little bit. And I changed my mind because I believe in data, okay? 
And what, what the opposite of that is, is just firmly believing, like, it's going to work, just keep studying it. And once you call, get a positive study, being like, oh, it's unethical now. We got that one study that shows that it worked. Stop studying it. We can't talk about this anymore. And they call the game early. Okay, they won't let it study anymore. Because people should change. We should modify it. Maybe the dosing is wrong. Maybe they need a higher or lower dose. We don't know. So that, I agree with you that it, it, it's amazing that people that should know how to do statistics are making such a glaring error. So the myths debunked. It's not different than the other lytics. It doesn't cause a Lazarus effect that's ever been seen in any evidence-based literature. It's not been consistently shown beneficial in trials. In fact, the opposite could be said. It should not be the standard of care, and it's not the only effective therapy. So we should focus on the other ones that work until someone shows that it does. And there are some really tiny references. Thanks, guys.